afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of the educational program planned to replace the MPE AGM annual general meeting, which, as you know, was cancelled due to the outbreak of the coronavirus infection. Uh, this is the reason why MPE is organizing a webinar series to cover all topics, including the agenda. Today's webinar on myeloma and yellow amyloidosis treatment updates will be, will be given by uh, Dr. Inger Nijhoff, Department of Hematology, University Medi Medical Center in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, for your information, this webinar will be fully recorded and will be uploaded to the Myeloma Patient Europe website, which is www.mpeuro.org. Um, it will be also available in the MP YouTube channel, so in case that you, you would like to share the webinar uh, or watch it again, you can do it in our YouTube channel or uh, in our website. Before we start, I would like to make a small summary of the webinar agenda. Uh, as you know, the webinar is scheduled from 6 to 7, so the presentation will last around 40, 45 minutes, and then I will open the session for questions. Uh, there are basically two ways in which you can ask questions to the doctor. Uh, the first one is using your microphone in your computer, as, as I'm doing right now. Just press the right hand button uh, that you will see in your screen. I will unmute you, and you can ask the question directly to the doctor. And the other possibility is to do that in right writings, uh, but using the question and answer window that you will see also in your screen. I will receive those questions and I will bring them so the doctor can answer them. So Dr. Nijhoff, on behalf of Myeloma Patients Europe, uh, I would like to thank you for, for your collaboration, for your time to, to prepare and to give this webinar today. Thank you for your kind introduction. It's really a pity that we can't see each other, but of course this is an alternative and I'm glad to be of help uh, in this way. We're going to talk about multiple myeloma and AL, amyloidosis. Um, and I'm from uh, the Netherlands. I'm a hematologist with uh, a focus on multiple myeloma, also in research, but also in the treatment, of course. Um, I cannot move my slides now. Okay. So we're, gonna, uh, we're going to discuss the diagnosis of multiple myeloma and also, of course, of amyloidosis. Then the current treatment, a little bit about the newly diagnosed transplant eligible patients, but also about the transplant ineligible patients. We're going to tap on relapsed patients. Of course, I'm also going to say something about the treatment of AL amyloidosis. And then we're going to tap shortly on the new treatment developments, the near future. Well, multiple myeloma, we call it an orphan disease. It's a rare disease. Of course, that's not the case for doctors as us working in Santa, seeing a lot of patients with multiple myeloma, but it is a rare disease. It is an uncontrolled growth of monoclonal plasma cells in the bone marrow. All of us have plasma cells in the bone marrow, but normally they are of different kinds, of different families. But in the case of multiple myeloma, these are monoclonal. That means they're all of the same family and they're causing problems, uh, especially end organ damage, like hypercalcemia, a high level of calcium is that, renal impairment, anemia, and lytic bone, le and lytic bone lesions. Well, I said it was an orphan disease, but it accounts for approximately 1% of all malignancies and it's the second most frequent hematologic malignancy. So there are a lot of patients, especially in the, in the specialized centers. The median age of diagnosis is 69, 70 years old, but there are a lot of patients younger and also older. And though it's rarely curable, fortunately, multiple myeloma is a highly manageable disease nowadays because of its rapid medical advancements over the past decades. Here you can see a picture of the IMWG and it states again the myeloma is the second most common blood cancer. We do a lot of research to, trying to optimize therapy. A lot of people living with it worldwide, 230,000. It was a picture of 2016. 70% of patients experience pain, which is, uh, is um, most often the symptom of which research has been done and the diagnosis has been uh, going into the light. And uh, as I said, the five-year overall survival rates have increased, fortunately, due to all the new treatment options we do have now. Who's at risk? Well, men a little bit more likely than women, one half more. 
and uh, the most frequently diagnosed in the 65s until 74, but what I said, also younger patients and older patients, we do have, of course, but it's the peak, and twice as common in people of African descent. This is Sarah Newberry on the picture. She's the first described multiple myeloma patients in 1844. So that's the first patient we recognized and then we didn't know what to do. That's why she was so happily damaged by the disease. Of course, that's not the case nowadays, fortunately. Like I said, multiple myeloma are malignant plasma cells in the bone marrow. Normally, like you can see in the picture, we all make normal plasma cells in the bone marrow and these normal plasma cells make antibodies. They have a function in the immune system. But when a patient has multiple myeloma, then they're all from the same family, these plasma cells. They're abnormal, they're monoclonal, so from the same family, and they all make the same antibody, which we call an M-protein. It can be a whole immunoglobulin. It can also be only the light change. I will show you on the next slide. And as I said, the main criteria, the symptoms are hypercalcemia, renal insufficiency, anemia, and bone lesions, osteolytic. Osteolytic means, I will show you uh, a slide further, two slides further. This is the amprotein, an am aminoglobulin, which is a happy chain in blue, but also has light chains in red. 20% of patients just have the light chains, then they don't have the blue ones in it. But most patients, 80% of them, have a whole aminoglobulin. Like I said, normal plasma cells are from different families and they make different antibodies, so we have a repertoire which has a function in the immune system, but multiple myeloma patients just have one immunoglobulin. It's a monoclonal one, and you can measure that in the blood. You can measure it uh, for diagnosis, but you can also use it during treatment. If it lowers during treatment, it's like a tumor marker, then it's a sign that the treatment is working. And then you don't have to go into the bone marrow every time to check if the treatment has effect. And this is what I said. Patients can have a whole immunoglobulin or they can just have the pre-light chains. What's the frequency of symptoms? Do all patients have the same symptoms? No, that's not the case. When the diagnosis is made, then 13% of the patients have a high level of calcemia, hypercalcemia. That's due to the fact that there is an increased osteoplastic Bone, resor bone resorption, so the calcium is going out of the bones. 20% of patients do have renal failure. That's because of the M protein or the free light chains who are gathering in the, in the kidneys and making damage, or because of the hypercalcemia, or because of the multiple myeloma cells themselves, or because of amyloidosis, which can be also there in patients with multiple myeloma or can be there just as a, another disease. But I will focus on, on the amyloidosis part a little bit later on. Anemia is present in 35% of the patients and diagnosis. That's caused by the bone marrow infiltration of the plasma cells because the percentage of plasma cells is growing. There's less space left for the normal cells and that cause anemia. And like I said, a lot of patients have bone pain at a diagnosis, well, different uh, research said different marks, of course, but between 60-70% of the patients do have bone pain because of the lytic bone lesions and pathologic fractures as a consequence can be there. And here you can see it. This is a patient. Here you can see the spine. And in, in dark, you can see uh, uh, with the marks here, you can see a dark spot a dark spot. These are lytic lesions. So these are actually little holes in the spine, in the bone. So what will we do when we think of multiple myeloma? Then we check the blood for an M protein, of course for anemia, but also for the other healthy blood cells, for the kidney function, uh, like we talked about. Then we check the urine, because there can be a lot of protein loss in the urine. We also do a bone marrow sample because there is where the sick cells are, where the monoclonal, monoclonal plasma cells are. And we would uh, like to see them and color them and see them with a the microscope. And we do also other research 
with the bone marrow, uh, prognostic will have prognostic value, like cytogenetics, the, the um, cytogenetic information within tumor cells. So it's not an hereditary disease, that's important to realize, but in tumor cells, the hereditary information cytogenetics are changed, and we can look at these cytogenetics, and they, these have prognostic value. That's what you can see here, cytogenetic evaluation. Then we look at the bones, um, most likely nowadays by a CT scan, but also conventional X-ray is used in Europe. Um, and newer research is MRI or PET-CT to look at the bones. And at the PET-CT, you can also uh, look at plasma cytoma, so at uh, a lot of plasma cells together, uh, which can be there in the body. Not with all patients, but some patients do have that also a diagnosis. And you can see it at a PET-CT. You can't see it that good at X-ray, for example. These are the six cells, the myeloma cells in the bone marrow. So when we take out of the, of the bone marrow, uh, we do a bone marrow biopsy, like you uh, as patients have, have experienced, most of you unfortunately, then we take a little bit of, of your bone marrow out of it and we look under the microscope. And these blue cells are the, are the malignant plasma cells. Some, uh, uh, they look like each other, sometimes they're a little bit different, but these healthy blue color of this uh, hell blue color is the color of the multiple myeloma cells. When do we start treatment? Of course, when we have made the diagnosis, but can we do it also before the diagnosis of multiple myeloma? Well, there are precursor states. We call it AMGUS or asymptomatic multiple myeloma. Smoldering multiple myeloma is not a name. So there are patients who we know have an M protein level or we know have uh, monoclonal plasma cells in the bone marrow, but they don't have symptoms yet. How do we know these patients? Of course, we don't know all of them, but we know some of them because when a patient has osteoporosis, for example, then a lot of doctors check for M protein level. And then we check, are there any symptoms of multiple myeloma? But when they're not there, then you can call it a precursor state of multiple myeloma. And depending on the level of M protein below or over 30 grams per liter, or depending on the percentage of sick plasma cells in your bone marrow under or over 10%, we call it AMGUS or asymptomatic multiple myeloma. When a patient has symptoms, then it becomes multiple myeloma. Every patient with multiple myeloma had a precursor state, only we don't know it always, because when a patient has back pain and we're going to evaluate, then we don't know that uh, in this case, uh, how long it was there, but we do know uh, from sampling um, uh, in, in countries, uh, just screening for uh, the all multiple myeloma patients had a precursor state and this, uh, or multiple myeloma asymptomatic. So if we know that, that we know from a patient that he has an M protein level or um, um, monoclonal plasma cells, are we going to treat them or not? They are not symptomatic yet. Why do we ask? Because we do have novel diagnostic guidelines based on new insight with more sensitive techniques. And we're trying to predict re which of these patients with precursor states are going to develop multiple myeloma? Is everyone that or just a part of the patients? And in what time? Because we want to prevent symptoms, of course, but every treatment has side effects and we don't want to harm a patient if he won't get sick or, or it takes years to get sick. So when will we treat when there is benefit? This is a graph with on the y-axis the prob probability of progression when a patient has an angus or a small ring multiple myeloma. The higher the line, the higher the chance of developing multiple myeloma in time. This is years, five years, 10 years, 15 years. And as you can see, for an angus patient, there's approximately 1% of the patients a year who develop multiple myeloma. So when you look at that, 1% a year, then you can say the majority never does develop multiple myeloma. So we should not treat AMGUS. 
because then you give them the side effects of the treatment and most of the patients won't develop multiple myeloma. Do not harm, only when the M protein itself, but these are exceptions, is, is causing problems. But what about the smoldering multiple myeloma? Because you already saw the other line. And this is steeper. So after 20 years, here you can see that after 20 years, 80% of these patients have developed multiple myeloma. So here it's another story. But can we know which of these patients will develop multiple myeloma in a short time? And does it have any benefit? Yes, it has, because these are high-risk smoldering myeloma patients. In red, the patients who are treated. In blue, the patient who did not have any treatment like we do it uh, normally. And then you can see how long they have progression-free survival, but also their overall survival. How long will these patients live? And when you treat them, the high-risk smoldering myeloma patients, then their progression-free survival is better, but also the overall survival. So the time they respond, they don't have any complaints is better, but also they live longer. So it's really important in this group to know which patients we have to treat. After five years, if a patient has smoldering myeloma, he has 10% chance a year. Thereafter, after he is known with smoldering myeloma for more than five years, then the, the curve is less steep. So then the chance of developing multiple myeloma is, um, is less big. So we should define these patients to treat them sooner than waiting for the criteria because we would like them to protect from renal failure or bone disease. Now, do we protect, how do we predict it? Well, I already told you this is an M protein. This is the free light chains. 20% of, of the patients only have free light chains, and a lot of patients do have an M protein and free light chains. We measure them at diagnosis. So we measure the M protein level, but also the free light chains. And when the free light chains are really high, uh, higher than 100, then you can see this is the chance of developing multiple myeloma for the patients with smoldering myeloma who have a free light chain ratio higher than 100, it's, it's significantly higher to develop multiple myeloma than when it's low. So you have a, a big risk of 72% in two years that these patients have multiple myeloma. That's such a big risk that we're going to treat these patients nowadays already. The same holds true when we do a bone marrow sample and we see a lot of sick plasma cells in the, in the bone marrow, more than 60%. Then uh, there's not anemia or something yet, but we know that the chance that the patients develop problems is even 95% in two years. So we're going to treat these patients, and that's, the, that's already what we do now in Europe and in America all over in our guidelines. And the last new thing is the MRI. So if we know a patient has small ring multiple myeloma and he has no uh, osteolytic lesions on CT, we make an MRI and when we look at the MRI and we see more than one focal lesion on the MRI and other way of looking at the bones, then also there's 70% chance that this patient will develop multiple myeloma in two years and that chance is so high that we say nowadays it's not only with CREP criteria that we're going to start treatment, so not only with hypercalcemia, renal insufficiency, anemia or bone lesion, but also these other criteria are important. So the, the bone marrow, the plasma cell percentage over 60%, high levels of free light chains of more than 100 and one, more than one focal lesion on MRI. So we look at this a diagnosis and even if there are no criteria that one of these symptoms are there, we're going to start treatment. So the definition of small ring myeloma is a little bit changed now uh, because uh, more than 60% is already treatment, is already multiple myeloma. And of course, uh, you don't have a smoldering myeloma if you have also amyloidosis, because that's also a reason for treatment. What is amyloidosis? Actually, you have a lot of forms of amyloidosis, but we're going to talk about AL amyloidosis. For the patients who are listening with AL amyloidosis, we're going to start on that topic now. There are patients with multiple myeloma who also have amyloidosis, but there are also a lot of patients who only have amyloidosis. 
is the protein misfolding disease. So the proteins the sick monoclonal plasma cells are making because it's also a disease of sick monoclonal plasma cells. But in this case, they're making proteins who are misfolding and making fibrils, long fibrils. And these fibrils are going to organs and, and, and cause problems in the organs. When we, when we go to the AL amyloidosis, then the, the protein which is causing the problem is the free light chain. The free light chain is there, but it is making these uh, sick uh, amyloid fibrils. And these fibrils are going, the, these are da dangerous, they are going to the organs and they are, are causing organ dysfunction. And because the organs are, are not functioning normal anima, anymore, the patients get sick. 76% of the patients with AL amyloidosis have heart involvement. And of course, we do need our heart very much. And 68% of the patients with AL amyloidosis have kidney involvement. Also, liver can be involved, the gastrointestinal tract, soft tissues like the skin, and also the nerves. So peripheral nerves or the autonomic uh, nerves. But most patients do have heart and kidney. Can we detect them in time? For the heart, there is a value, a measurement, anti pro p called, and that's a sensitive marker of myocardial dysfunction in AL amyloidosis. Here you can see a graph with a level of anti pro p On the left, patients with AL amyloidosis with cardiac involvement on the right, the normal values, and that's significantly higher in these patients, even before symptoms. That's really important. So there are patients who are not symptomatic yet. They have an AMGUS. So if we know patients have an AMGUS, then we should check for the anti pro BMP because it's important to detect AL amyloidosis in time before there are any symptoms of the heart. And the other thing, another early red flag, you can call them, next to the heart, is the kidney. So when the kidney is damaged, then it lo loses proteins, also albumin. So when you lose a lot of albumin proteins in the urine, and we can measure that, then it's a sign that then you have a, a suspicion that there might be amyloidosis. So that's why patient uh, doctors especially Dr. Malini and Palladini, who are working in Italy their whole life already with patients with AL amyloidosis, stayed very um, much to, to other doctors and patients. Please, patients with an AMGUS and an abnormal free light chain ratio should have also tested on the biomarkers for the cardiac function and the, and the renal function with anti pro BMP and albuminuria. Because of this research, we do that and we can detect amyloidosis patients earlier, and that's really important. So when should a hematologist think about amyloidosis? Well, of course, with the AMGUS and the anti pro BMP and the um, uh, albumin in the urine, of course, but what are the symptoms we should think of AL amyloidosis? Well, for example, when a patient has severe fatigue and an unexplained weight loss, these can uh, go together with a gastrointestinal uh, tract, for example. Lack swelling due to the proteinuria. Also carpal tunnel syndrome, especially when it's on both sides. So then patients have complaints in the fingers, they're not feeling uh, or have thin holes in it. Also patients with peripheral neuropathy. Um, so when they have a sensory loss in their foot or in their hands, not because of treatment or because of diabetes, but unexplained. Autonomic neuropathy, so that means that when uh, hypertension, when you're standing, or, or erectile, or bladder, or bowel dysfunction, and also with hepatomegaly, so when your liver is really big and we don't have an explanation for it, then we should think about amyloidosis and test for it. What is the test? Well, first, you have to think of it, of course. Then you can do the biomarkers like the free light chains and the anti pro BMP and the um, uh, albumin in urine, but then you can search for the amyloid fibrils. A place will have a lot of amyloid fibrils 
is the abdominal fat. So we can take some of the abdominal fat and we can color for the fibrils if there is some amyloid in it. And we can also color the bone marrow sample if there's amyloid in it. And together it has a sensitivity of 90%. So if you think of it, then you should test it in the abdominal fat and in the bone marrow. And of course, uh, you can check the organ which is involved, like the kidney or the heart or the nerve or the liver. You can take a biopsy about it uh, in that organ and color it for amyloidosis. So that was about the diagnosis. Let's go back to multiple myeloma. Treatment for multiple myeloma and amyloidosis uses the same medication. Not in the same, uh, uh, exactly the same way, but the medications are more or less the same because you're treating the sick plasma cells. The sick plasma cells um, is the cause of the problem in multiple myeloma and also in amyloidosis. Only in amyloidosis, the free light chains are making the fibrils and there's also a problem with the gathering of these fibrils in the organs. But when you get rid of the sick multiple myeloma cells, then you're treating both diseases, the multiple myeloma and the amyloidosis. Fortunately, the, improved, the, the survival of multiple myeloma patients have improved very much. Um, and here you can see a survival curve a graph with on the y-axis the survival, on the x-axis the time in months. And then you can see here that for years there was not that much improvement. But uh, when we look in the 90s to the 2000 years, then there was a big improvement in survival, the, uh, this red one. And it was because of the, uh, the development of high dose melphalan. And then we needed the autologous stem cell transplantation because when you give high dose gamma therapy to a patient, then not only the plasma cells um, are bothered, but also um, the, the normal cells are bothered. So uh, to, to have the healthy cells back, we give the autologous stem cells to the patient after the high dose gamma therapy, the high dose melphalan, and then the healthy cells recover, but the multiple myeloma cells suffer. And you can see the second big shift in the overall survival line is uh, after uh, 2000 approximately. And this is mainly because of all the novel agents for multiple myeloma. And here you can see 1814, like we started, the first documented case with multiple myeloma. We didn't know what to do. We gave the patient rhabarb and orange peel, steel, quinine. It didn't work. And it stays for years that we tried a lot as doctors, but there was not really helping for the disease. It took until 1950. Then there was melphalan, a classical chemotherapeutic. Uh, it was low dose at that moment. It worked. But when they discovered in the 80s, 90s, that you can give it also as a high dose, and then with an autolysis stem cell transplantation, there was a real shift in overall survival, as you could see on the prior slides, and the development of the novel agents, like thalidomide, bortezomib, lenalidomide. These are not chemotherapeutics, but these are medications who are working directly or more directly on the multiple myeloma cells and also uh, working on the immune system of the patients, a little bit shaping the immune system, which is, favor uh, well, is which actually not favorable for multiple myeloma cells. And that's working very good, especially when you combine them and after these novel agents, there are even newer novel agents, second generation, third, uh, third generation, and are already we newer um, medication. I will uh, a little bit uh, tell you about that. In the sake of time, I can just uh, tell, I, I can't tell everything, unfortunately, but, uh, but I will, of course, tell you something about it. And what's really important that with the development of the new medication, when you look at the survival, it was a little bit in, increasing with the uh, with the chemotherapeutics, with the, in, with the uh, supportive care. But when, with the new medication, there's really a good advance in the overall survival. So how do we use them? How do we use all of these medication now? Well, these are the ESMO guidelines. Uh, for patients who can have a transplant. So the high-dose melphalan and the autologous stem cell transplantation. These are all Europe, uh, European uh, doctors, um, multiple myeloma doctors, writing these guidelines together 
also in our center we're working uh, with these guidelines and writing uh, with these guidelines and the frontline treatment for transplant candidates so patients who can uh, um, tolerate high dose chemotherapeutics and autologous stem cell transplantation so the younger patients are first treated with these newer agents with bortezomib, thalidomide, uh, uh, lenalidomide uh, combined with bortezomib, dexmedicine, um, these induction regimens so a, a few cycles and we combine different combinations of these new agents and after four to six of these cycles the multiple myeloma is responding and then we go to the consolidation phase we, uh, so to the uh, high dose melphalan and autologous stem cell transplantation uh, to, to treat it even better. So when the multiple myeloma is very low, then we go to the high dose melphalan and the stem cell transplantation to keep it away as long as possible. Thereafter, after the autologous stem cell transplantation, nowadays, since a few years, we offer the patients lenalidomide, lenalidomide maintenance. So when you offer the patients a maintenance treatment, it, it adds to the progression free survival. So when uh, it adds to the time that the disease is responding before it's coming back, but it also adds to overall survival how long the patient is, uh, is living. So this is more or less the standard in whole Europe. We give induction cycles to lower the burden of disease. Thereafter, we do consolidation therapy with high dose melphalan and stem cell transplantation. And thereafter, lenalidomide maintenance. This is for the patients who can tolerate uh, a high dose melphalan and an autologous stem cell transplantation. Of course, we always have questions because we always want to improve. So are we now with an optimal induction regimen or can we further improve? Do we still need the high dose melphalan and autologous stem cell transplantation because there are newer uh, medication, newer novel agents? If we combine them, do we still need the high dose melphalan and the stem cell transplantation uh, right away at diagnosis or later on at relapse? once or even twice. Some countries are doing that also in the Netherlands for high risk before, but for example. Do we need consolidation therapy? So like there are, there are um, countries working with induction regimens, induction cycles, and after the stem cell transplantation, they repeat two or four of these cycles that we call it consolidation. Is it really necessary uh, or not? Uh, can we improve it if we use it? And is the maintenance optimal now? Is it only lenalidomide? Is it for every patient? How long will we give it? Uh, can we adapt it uh, when the patient have a real uh, uh, deep response? Well, these questions are all questions who are in research, like all the lessons we have learned in the past we did with research, and we are continuously uh, performing research to further optimize the treatment and to further improve prognosis of our patients. And fortunately, there are uh, newer kits on the block, uh, like newer generations of the lenalidomide, thalidomide, like pomalidomide, newer generations of bortezomib, like carfilzomib or ixazomib, but also antibodies. And these are really new. What is an antibody? For lymphoma, for example, we already had them. For other solid tumors, we had them for years, but we didn't have them for multiple myeloma. So there was a search for it. What are antibodies? They're like a flag. You give it intravenously or subcutaneously to the patient and they're like a flag to the, uh, who is marking the tumor cell. And when it's on the tumor cell, then your own immune system recognizes the tumor cell and can kill it. You need something to bind on. The, the flag has to stand on something on the multiple myeloma cells. There are some of these markers, but we, we had no um, uh, monoclonal antibody for multiple myeloma for years, but recently, since a few years, we do have, and especially uh, monoclonal antibodies against CD38 on the multiple myeloma cell and against CS1 uh, on the multiple myeloma cell are regularly used now uh, for frontline treatment even, but especially nowadays in the relapse setting. It's moving to the upfront setting. And the most well-known and most used one is daratumumab, which binds to the CD38 on the multiple myeloma cell, the flag on the CD38 on the multiple myeloma cell. Here you can see it, multiple myeloma cell, here's the flag. And because of this flag, the normal complement 
which is in the body, the normal macrophages, which are cells of your immune system, the normal NK cells can do their job and kill the tumor cell. They are there, but they need a flag to do their job. Also, daratumumab can kill multiple myeloma uh, uh, their cells, so there are more working mechanisms than just one, and they can modulate the immune system, the T cells of the, of the patients. So uh, uh, T cells are normally working to viruses, uh, um, malignant cells, but in multiple myeloma, they're not working that well. But when you improve them, uh, then they can uh, function better and they can kill the multiple myeloma cells. So it has uh, um, multiple working mechanisms. And we're very glad that we have uh, monoclonal antibody therapy now also for multiple myeloma. What you can see here is that even as a monotherapy, so only the, um, uh, the daratumumab is giving response to one, uh, approximately one third of the patients. Normally you don't give an antibody, uh, you can give it as a monotherapy, but normally you would like combine antibody therapy with other agents. And that's also what we do uh, a lot in, uh, for multiple myeloma. And then you can further improve, then it works together. And then it works synergistically together. And that means that one and one is not two, but even three. So the monoclonal antibody can work synergistic with uh, other medications given for multiple myeloma, and then it works even better. And this is a, an example of a combination with, of daratumumab with lenalidomide. Uh, these are the response rates on the left for the patients treated with lenalidomide and the daratumumab. 94% of the patients are responding versus patients treated with lenalidomide. 77% uh, of the patients are responding. So you can further improve response rates but also the duration of response, how long the patients are responding. That is what you can see here in this graph, the time the patients are responding and alive. Uh, no, the, sorry, the, the percentage of patients who are responding and alive, and here's the time on the x-axis, and the higher the line, the longer the patients are responding and alive. And for the combination of daratumumab with lenalidomide, uh, is, is, this line is much higher than the line for only lenalidomide. So the combination uh, really improved. Uh, and really benefits the patients. There are also, so this slide is just to tell you, there are also other monoclonal antibodies and also these antibodies are working together with our therapies and are also options to treat our patients with. Like alotuzumab, which is binding to CS1 on the multiple myeloma cell. It has no single agent activity, this one, so you have to, to combine it, you have to combine it with other agents. Daratumab, you can give it on its own. So what our, for our patients who can't be treated with, an, with a transplant because uh, they are not that fit uh, and they can't have, they can't tolerate uh, high dose chemotherapy. Well, the doctor who started with transplant said, well, everyone is transplant eligible, but that's not completely true. It's not, at least it's not that black and white. Um, it's also not the case that 65 years of age is the limit per se. Uh, also, also, all the patients can be very fit and can be have and can have benefit of a stem cell transplantation. Although you have to select these patients because the the less fit patients will, uh, will have more problems, will more have side effects, and and we can also lose these patients because of the high dose melphalan and stem cell transplantation. Sometimes they don't survive the treatment. So we have, when a patient is older, they can benefit a stem cell transplantation, but we have to select these patients very well. And that's what we do nowadays. But are there also other options for these patients? Yes, there are. For years in Europe, we used bortezomib, malvolan, prednisone, so a tree drug, or lenalidomide, lenalidomide dexamethasin. And that worked very well, but of course, also here, we want to improve. And how do you? Well, you can combine it with daratumumab, for example, the monoclonal antibody. And that's what we do with the VMP combination and the RD combination, which we used for years. One of these two, both of them in trials are, were combined with daratumumab and they uh, proved better the combination. So uh, dara VMP is already um, approved by AMA and reimbursed. And uh, it will be a matter of time, and that will also be the case for daratumumab, lenalidomide, dexamethasone. You can also combine the bortezomib with the lenalidomide, and you can also make even a quadruplet so that you even add 
the Daratumab to bortezomib and lenalidomide. These are still studies. So this is not current treatment. We have to await for these results. But here you can see the results of the patients treated with daratumab lenalidomide versus lenalidomide. And then you can see the same uh, curves. So in uh, the higher the line, the longer the patients respond and uh, the longer they live. And for the combination with daratumab lenalidomide, the line is far above the yellow line. So it adds for the patients, also for the elderly patients to treat them with the combination. This is upfront treatment. So newly diagnosed elderly patients treated with the combination of daratumab lenalidomide dex medicine uh, versus lenalidomide dex medicine. And the counterpart, the other, the VMP, VMP combined or not combined with daratumab uh, is giving the same scheme. So the VMP like we did in the past or combined with daratumumab and then you can see the same picture in purple, the patient's VMP combined with daratumumab. In orange, the patient just with VMP. And also here, the line is much higher. So the patients are benefiting the combination with daratumumab. They are living longer and they are longer progression free. So what if they relapse, then we should look what was their prior treatment, what were side effects, um, what's the age, What's the general health? Are the comorbidities, of course, but then we can give another combination than that the patient had before. Um, with bortezomib, we can combine daratumumab, for example, but also other medications, elutuzumab was the other monoclonal antibody, for example, and combinations always do better than just one medication when they cooperate together. That's what you, the, the same holds true for patients who were treated with bortezomib first and are treated with lenalidomide that relapse. When you combine the lenalidomide with daratumumab, we have already seen that's better, but the same holds true if you combine it with the proteasome inhibitor, the next generation, bortezomib, uh, carfilzomib, for example, or exazomib, the oral variant, then uh, it's better than just the lenalidomide itself. And also the lenalidomide is combined with alotuzumab, the other monoclonal antibody. So normally we switch class. Was a patient treated with lenalidomide before? Then we go to the proteasome inhibitor and we make combinations as long as that's possible. Because combinations do uh, uh, better. And normally, especially with daratumumab, um, uh, when you add it to the regimens, then there are not that much more side effects because it's also very important uh, that the quality of life is very good and the side effects are more or less the same when you add daratumumab. Um, to lenalidomide dexamethasone as the side effects are with, with lenalidomide dexamethasone. So that's also a very important point. Going back to the AL amyloidosis and looking at the time, I think we should go a little bit uh, faster because for the amyloidosis, uh, we use the same medication. Uh, Malpolin dexamethasone was, of course, the first at a low dose. And we also tried autologous stem cell transplantation. It works for amyloidosis, but for the patient with severe cardiac or renal failure, it's dangerous. So we should select the patients very good. Also here, the new medications like bortezomib combined with cyclophosphamide, an alternative for melphalan and dexamethasone, improved uh, versus melphalan and dexamethasone. So also here there are newer regimens, newer combinations who improve response rate and progression-free survival and who are tolerated very well. And when you look at the advices also from Malini from um, uh, Italy, then you can see for the patients who are transplant eligible, which is a smaller part in amyloidosis because of the cardiac and renal uh, function, uh, only 20% of patients can have a transplant, uh, but when they have, then we give them Cybor-D, the bortezomib cyclophosphamide dexamethasone, or bortezomib dexamethasone, uh, if necessary, especially when the plasma cells percentage is high, then the autologous stem cell transplantation, and we just give them consolidation or maintenance if the response is not that good. However, when patients do have cardiac, uh, especially severe, but also um, moderate cardiac um, dysfunction and renal dysfunction, then we treat them with CYBRD longer, but no transplants, but also other all the regimens are uh, regimens we still use. 
and as 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 more advanced the patient is, the 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 the, the less uh, optimistic it is for the the um, survival. So we would really treat these patients in time. Also for the AL amyloidosis, all of the newer agents are in clinical trials also for AL amyloidosis and also benefit these patients. And especially here in red, the daratumumab, the monoclonal antibody, doesn't have that much side effects, but has tremendous response rates. There's also here the monoclonal antibodies, especially the daratumumab, is moving into the AL amyloidosis, which is really beneficial for our patients. And one remark I would like to make is that also dox uh, doxycycline for the AL amyloidosis patients is added, especially for the cardiac involvement. It's an antibiotics actually, but the patients who are treated with it do it better in survival. And that's because in all the treatments for amyloidosis, the, the, uh, the, 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 clonal, the clonal plasma cells are treated, but we don't treat the amyloidosis, which is in the organs, the, uh, the body itself has to clean it. Doxycycline uh, seems to work, seems to help cleaning the amyloidosis in the, in the organs, the fibrils. Uh, so still studies are ongoing, but certainly for our cardiac patients with amyloidosis, we give them doxycycline because of these curves. So what are the newest developments? The newest developments are T cells. I already told you there are different parts of the immune system and T cells normally do have a function for viruses like coronavirus, for um, bacteria, but also for tumor cells. However, in multiple myeloma, cell, uh, multiple myeloma patients or actually in every uh, malignant uh, disease, they fail. They should do their job, but they don't clean it because this disease is there. The cancer actually escapes to the T cells by different ways. Because normally when a T cell is binding to a tumor cell, it's making granules and then the tumor cell is going to die. And this, uh, we can make T cells of the patients their self, we can take them out of the body, change them a little bit and gave it back for patients with ALL and for certain forms of lymphoma and it works. Not for every patients, unfortunately, but for a lot of patients with ALL, it works. We can even cure them with in relapse disease. So, of course, we are really uh, thrilled that, that we can do these things also for our multiple myeloma patients now. It's just in research, but we're making progress, and that's really important. We make it, getting the T cells out of the patients, we're giving them some extra tools in the laboratory so they can recognize the multiple myeloma cells better and kill the multiple myeloma cells better. And when we have given them these armamentarium, then we're giving their own T cells of the patients with this extra back to the patient, and then it's going to do their job. That's the idea. And in clinical studies only, but in clinical studies, uh, we're treating patients with CAR T. Uh, and a lot of um, what you can see here in this table, you don't have to go into detail, but what you can see is there are not that much patients treated yet. Of course, this patient number is growing uh, because of the clinical trials we're running uh, worldwide and also in Europe, but we can see tremendous responses in patients who have been happily pre-treated, so that's great. Unfortunately, in almost all of these patients, there are relapses, but the time of response is really uh, tremendous for patients who are happily pre-treated. So there is really hope also for this new treatment. And what's also a message is that there's not only CAR T for this T cell or immune uh, treatment. There are also bispecific antibodies. So there are also other treatments who, are, who have the same goal to uh, um, improve the own T cell function of the patient against the multiple myeloma cell. So for the future, immune therapy will be important in the course of the disease. It will also move forward, if it works in the, in the relapse setting, then it will go to the upfront setting. And of course, these are CAR T's, but these are also bispecific, so uh, antibodies who are binding as well as the multiple myeloma cell, as well as the T cells, bringing them together, and also other forms of immune therapy. And then I would like to end with an optimistic view. We hope that this trend of, of improving survival for our patients will further develop with our new treatment options and will maybe 
in, or in, let's say will further improve the 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 the, the, the survival rate will be really great and especially when it when it accounts with when it comes with a, a good quality of life of course that's our goal and this is the part when there are any questions left maybe Thank you, Dr. Nijhoff, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, now I will going to open the floor for questions. Just quickly remind you that there are two ways to ask questions. One of them is using the microphone, as I'm doing right now, and ask directly to the doctor. To do that, just click the right hand button. So if you have any question, you just uh, can start in clicking. And uh, the other way is to send their question in the in the chat window, so I can receive them and, and read them to the doctor. Um, one of the questions that we already received is, uh, you mentioned there are myeloma treatments in clinical trials for yellow myelidosis. Uh, when can we expect any of them to be approved? Um, well, it's going faster and faster, I would say, and that's because of the cooperation between countries and, and also between continents. So the CAR-T studies, for example, uh, are running in Europe and also in the United States. Uh, it, 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 as I told you, it's a rare disease, not that rare for, for a multiple myeloma doctor or for a patient, of course, but, uh, but it is a rare disease. But when you cooperate, then you can treat in a short time a lot of patients with these new promising treatments. And then you have sooner the answers. Are they working like you hope so, uh, like you hope to? And are they having uh, also uh, really the benefits? So uh, also the side effects, of course, are really important. Uh, the, the, uh, how they work, but also the side effects. Uh, and when you know that, when, when a treatment is really better, uh, benefiting, benefiting the patients, then you can offer it to, um, to the uh, authorities and then they, uh, then they will approve it. And thereafter, there is reimbursement. So um, the, the insurances, of course, have to, uh, have, to have the arrangements uh, how, how to implement it. Uh, but these tracks are faster and faster as we are working more and more together. Thank you, doctor. We have a couple of hands in the panel. So uh, first of, of them, Lidio Arisi, you can ask your question now. Lidio, not sure if you are, can you hear us? Well, it seems uh, he's not hearing us. So with the second question, Hans, please. Uh, hello, this is uh, Hans Schurer from the Netherlands. Um, I have one question uh, according to the induction stage uh, of the treatment of myeloma. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, in most cases, VCD or, or VTD is, is given as a pre-chemo uh, for before auto stem cell transplantation. But um, I was wondering, uh, will uh, VRD, so with Reflamid, uh, replace this? Uh, and is there a role for daratumumab in the in the in the induction stage? Yes, really good questions. Um, I just was brought on this one uh, with a slide that we are going uh, or we're trying to improve this. Uh, well, VRD uh, has never been uh, randomized against VTD and VCD, and that's the problem for the authorities because they they actually need randomized trials to say if it's really better or not. Uh, when we compare the studies, then we see that maybe the response rate is a little bit better uh, or at least comparable. However, the tolerability for lanolidomide is better. That's why we would like to use VRD uh, now instead of VTD, but it's not approved. So we cannot do that, at least not in Europe. It is approved in, uh, in America. Uh, so uh, there, is, there is possible. But because of it's more or less uh, the same in the response rate, um, it's not approved yet. However, studies are running because we would like to approve, uh, we would like to offer the data to the authorities uh, to get this approved. And also studies are running for the combination with daratumumab, as well as with PTD, as well as with VRD. And these studies uh, are not uh, uh, that far that it is approved yet, but it will just be a matter of time. Thank you very much, uh, very much, doctor. Uh, I can see Lydia, your hands again uh, rising, so I uh, let's try again. 
well, it seems there are some technical questions, so I just suggest you just you send me your question by by writing, and then I will ask the doctor. Uh, another question that we have here is: uh, it is expected that treatments that we have now in relapse setting are used in their in earlier phases of the disease. Could that mean more efficacy? Exactly, exactly. When um, uh, when you treat the patients uh, when they have newly diagnosed disease, then they are uh, then they have the best uh, chance of responding uh, deeply and longer. So when you give the best uh, shot at the beginning, then the patients have the best benefit of that regimen. But of course, when there is a new medication, you should uh, first know for sure, because you start in the laboratory, you start with multiple myeloma cells in the laboratory, you start uh, with mice uh, research, and then it's going to translate into studies. When you have really good, good treatments, because the treatments are already uh, very good when you compare it to 20 years ago, for example, uh, but when you have new treatments, you should first prove that they are really working there are, and that they are safe, so that they are not having that much side effects indeed and then thereafter you have to, to prove that they are better so it takes time but like I said it's going faster and faster uh, because we're doing a lot of studies always with the intention to improve the treatment and we're working together. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. The combination therapy is mostly lenalidomide. When lenalidomide is not possible anymore because of side effects are there alternatives for lenalidomide or should you continue with monotherapy? No, the, uh, um, well, sometimes when you no, does not tolerate uh, a certain regimen, then you can't not give it to the patient because, uh, of course, the quality of life is also uh, is maybe even the most important. Um, so um, uh, you have to anticipate on that. There are newer generations in it, uh, so formalidomide, for example, which is given less polyneuropathy, uh, but it can also give other combinations with uh, possibly less neuropathy. So then uh, that, that was the slide where I tried to say when you have relapsed disease, for example, you have to uh, take into account how, how is the patient treated before, but also the side effects. Uh, is he, uh, are there any comorbidities? And then you adapt the treatment. And that's fortunately possible because we have options. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Uh, what would you say there are, uh, are the main challenges in myeloma in the upcoming years? Well, there are a lot of challenges. Um, as long as the, the disease is not curable, uh, we would certainly search for that. And for now on, uh, for now, still up till now, I mean, uh, uh, high-dose melphalan and autology stem cell transportation is a standard care of treatment, but it's also a happy part of the treatment. We would like um, uh, the, the treatment so good that we don't need it maybe anymore or, uh, or spare it for the future. Um, uh, but also there are very, um, um, how do you say, uh, well, we have, uh, it's not only uh, ne having new treatments, it's also um, showing to the authorities that they should approve it and also to the insurance, the reimbursement. And of course, with all these new treatments, patients living longer with multiple myeloma, but also living longer in general. So needing more treatments and all these treatment options are also very expensive. There are also some uh, problems maybe in that, and we, we, we should take care of that with each other also. Thank you, doctor. Uh, next question. CAR T cell therapy is one of the most promising treatments in myeloma, but uh, clinical trials are done in a small number of patients. When can we expect uh, to have them close to the clinical practice or in the clinical practice? Yeah, because of time, uh, I couldn't go into depth into the CAR T. Um, for ALL, it's, uh, uh, so the acute lymphatic le leukemia and, and, and lymphoma, we are further with it, uh, but it's working a little bit better there. Um, so um, there, are, uh, uh, there are a big part of patients who are cured when we give that treatment, when we give it to multiple myeloma patients, that's the same for all our other treatments up till now. Uh, we can give them time and we can really give them deep responses but we can't cure them yet. And so uh, there is improvement necessary also for CAR-T, um, but in, there are a lot of clinical studies now, also randomized phase trials, because you start with uh, phase one trials, uh, a low dose, then you start with phase two trials, 
then you, then you give it to more patients in a, in a beneficial dose, so you know what was working, but also what's safe. And thereafter, there are the phase three trials, and then you're randomizing uh, against another treatment. And you need that because you have to prove that it's better and that it's safe, and that you can only prove if you compare it to the good regimens there are. So that's the these studies we need, and these studies are running. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. How long can a patient remain on maintain maintenance therapy, lenalidomide in this case, till progression, or, or should the maintenance be stopped at some point? Yeah, that's also a research question, actually. Um, we give it up until progression in our guidelines, because that this, uh, this was done in most of the studies, and this was where the beneficial, uh, where the most proof is that it's beneficial, but that's because of the design of the studies. And now we are going, uh, now there are other studies uh, looking at when we look at really deep responses, can we maybe stop, uh, stop it uh, and maybe uh, give it back if, if the response is less deep, for example. These are questions because when you take medications for years, for example, then sometimes there are more side effects. And is it necessary to treat all patients the same or are there specific subsets who benefit from uh, continuing and other specific subsets who can stop? Uh, and uh, we don't know this yet. These are also research questions. Thanks, doctor. Uh, we are running out of time, but we have uh, time for the last question. Uh, could CAR T uh, therapy work also in the yellow amyloidosis? That's a good question. Uh, it's not tried in amyloidosis as far as I'm aware of. Um, that's also because uh, I, I didn't go into uh, the side effects now, um, but, uh, but also CAR T has side effects, um, especially when you gave it to the patient the first few weeks, we, we see side effects, um, and, and uh, especially a cardiac uh, amyloidosis patients may not tolerate these side effects, but we don't know yet. Uh, but, but when you look at the daratumumab and the, all the other medications, for example, they benefited the multiple myeloma patients, they benefited the amyloidosis patients. Just when you look at it that way, I guess also the CAR-T will benefit, but it has to be safe too. So also there we need trials. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, thank you very much for this interesting webinar. And just remind you all that uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be available in the MPE website, which is www.mpeuro.org, and will be available also in our YouTube channel. Uh, thanks again, Doctor, for, for your help and your collaboration with this webinar, and have you all a nice evening. Thank you. Nice evening, too, for you, too.